All right, well, this morning, as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at the uh, very familiar account of the man with the legion who is delivered by Jesus. Uh, we're going to read the, uh, the text, uh, verses 26 through 39 of Luke chapter 8, and then we'll uh, go ahead and uh, look at it. So first of all, beginning in verse 26, then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he came out onto the land, he was met by a man from the city who was possessed with demons and who had not put on any clothing for a long time and was not living in a house but in the tombs. Seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell before him and said in a loud voice, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For it had seized him many times. And he was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard. And yet he would break his bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, legion, for many demons had entered him. They were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. Now, there uh, was a herd of many swine feeding there on the mountain. And the demons implored him to permit them to enter the swine, and he gave them permission. And the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they ran away and reported it in the city and out in the country. The people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting down at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they became frightened. Those who had seen it reported to them how the man who was demon-possessed had been made well. And all the people of the country of the Gerasenes and the surrounding district asked him to leave them, for they were gripped with great fear. And he got into a boat and returned. But the man from whom the demons had gone out was begging him that he might accompany him. But he sent him away saying, return to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. So he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Well, may the Lord bless his, his word to our um, understanding this morning. Now, last week, remember, we saw that... Um, it, it matters what we believe about Jesus, right? Uh, we saw that um, basically um, people had uh, a variety of ideas uh, uh, about him. Uh, remember that um, Jesus had to show his disciples who he was. We see in our world that there are a variety of uh, ideas. Some believe that Jesus isn't real. And if that were the case, then what he supposedly said and did really doesn't make any difference. Doesn't make any difference to us. It doesn't make any difference to anyone. We can simply ignore him as we would any other man made God of any other man made religion. If he was only a good and wise teacher, we might decide to listen to him, but we might decide not to. Um, because uh, really, if we decided not to, all we would lose would be perhaps a little bit of wisdom that he has to teach us. We saw that if he was just one prophet among many, we might listen to him, or we might listen to one of the many others uh, in the world to guide us in our relationship with the Lord. But if Jesus is who he claimed to be, the one whom the Father sent into the world to save us, the only one who can actually save us because he is God and man, then we had better listen to Jesus, right? We had better trust him. We had better follow him. Because uh, if we don't, and he being the only way, remember, if we don't, we will perish. Now, I do believe that's one of the reasons why Jesus brought his disciples out into the middle of the lake in the storm. He wanted to show them who he was. And, you know, it, it actually worked. Uh, when Jesus uh, was able to still the, the wind and the waves with a word, they asked this question in Luke 8, 25. Who then is this? that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Well, it's sort of a um, rhetorical question, isn't it, in a certain sense, because who else could he be? 
He's the one who made all these things. He's the one who has authority over these things. Only God can command the creation and have it obey him. Well, the point is, if we are to be saved, then we need to trust the biblical Jesus. We need to trust the Jesus who is both God and man because that's who he is, the one who has authority over all things. And I should also mention this, that if we are to have the courage that we need to serve him in a world that hates him, we need to believe that he has control uh, over all things, that he's in control of the world. He's in control of all the living creatures as we've seen. He's in control of, of sickness. He has authority over that. He has authority over life. He raises the dead. He has authority over inanimate things as well. He commands the creation and it obeys him. If he has all this power, then how can we you know, not trust him to keep us as he has promised that he would as we go out to serve him? So that was one of the reasons why Jesus took his disciples out on the lake. But we see this morning that there was another reason, and that is that he might go to the other side of the lake because he had an appointment there in the country of the Gerasenes to deliver a man possessed by a legion of demons in order that he might teach his disciples another valuable lesson. Now, we know that Jesus had already basically battled the enemy in the wilderness. He confronted the devil and overcame him. I don't think his disciples were there when that happened. So they may not have known about that, or perhaps they did. And they may not yet have seen him, at least according to Luke's gospel, seen him cast out demons, seen his authority over them firsthand. But now they get to see him overcome an army of demons at one time. They, they become eyewitnesses of this as he sets this demon-possessed man free. Now, this morning, what I want to do is divide up what I've just read into five things, and each of these will have their own particular application, but I'll, I'll summarize basically all of that at the end. But this, these are the five things I want us to see. First of all, that um, this account tells us the demons hate us, and they want to destroy us. Secondly, it tells us that Jesus has authority over the demons. Uh, thirdly, it, it tells us how unconverted people respond to what Jesus does, how the city responded. Fourthly, how people are changed by the grace of the Lord, how the man responded. And then fifthly, I just want to collect all of these things together and, and apply them uh, at the end because even though we may not necessarily be faced with demon possession, I think uh, we, we do know that there is um, a sense in which we do, uh, well, Jesus has delivered us from something very, very similar. Now, first of all, I want us to see that demons hate and they want to destroy us. Certainly Lucifer does, right? The devil. But these fallen angels, these demons, are essentially the same character as the devil. They want to do the same thing. Look at what they did to this particular man because that's what they want to do to us that's what they would do to us, and worse, if it weren't for Jesus. Well, first of all, we see that they seized this man. They took control of this man. This is the same word that Luke will later use to describe what the leaders of Israel did when they dragged Stephen before the council against his will. These demons were controlling this man, dragging him against his will to do various things, and this had been happening uh, Luke tells us, for some time. They shamed this man by forcing him to strip off his clothing. This man had not worn clothes for a long time, which means, means he was running around naked. He was living naked. That is a very shameful thing. They separated him from society. Uh, and when we think about what that society was, you know, it's, it's the old covenant church. We're talking about Jewish community here. He was separated from fellowship with the Old Covenant Church, they forced him to live away from his home. They drove him out into the desert. And essentially, he also was living among the tombs. So we might say he, uh, the demons drove him away from the church. They constantly confronted him with what I think most people fear the most, and that is death. Why were the demons forcing him to live in the tombs? It's so he could see what his future was. Essentially, this is what is in store for you, death. 
you know, it's interesting that archaeologists uh, who've gone out, and I think we can actually go out today into the country of the Gerasenes, and we can see the, 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 basically the, the sides of the hills are still uh, basically peppered with these, these tombs. So this is where the man was living. They gave him unnatural strength. Uh, it seems as though as they would imprison him and he would break his chains, he eventually got to the point where nobody could subdue him. Uh, we read in Mark chapter 5, verses 3 through 4, and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. So basically, nobody could stop him anymore. He was an unstoppable force. These demons tormented this man, and they caused him to inflict injury on himself. We read also in Mark chapter 5, verse 5, constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. And then, of course, not being satisfied with what they were doing to him, they also used him to attack other people. We read in Matthew 8, verse 28, they were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. If you're going to travel that direction, you better, you know, get, get ready because this, this guy was going to run out and he was going to attack you. Now, we do need to realize that even in this situation, this man still had a certain measure of protection. It sounds kind of strange, but it's true because these demons could have taken the man and torn him limb from limb. They could have destroyed him and, and you know, killed him if it wasn't for three things. The first thing was their own desire to torment the man. You know, they, they wanted his, the torture and the pain and the anguish to last. They wanted to use him to hurt other people, right? He was attacking everybody that walked by that way. But most importantly, he was protected because the Lord was protecting him. We need to remember that uh, a lot of the things that were happening in the land of Palestine were happening because Jesus was there to display his glory and his power and this man was possessed also with that in mind. It was a part of God's plan, although realizing that we don't know how he fell into these circumstances. Could have happened, I suppose, to anyone. And realizing what we deserve, we don't deserve any better. We can't say that, you know, the man didn't deserve what happened to him. But the main point is this, that Jesus was going to deliver him. So secondly, let's get to the good news. We see Jesus' authority over these demons. When the demons saw Jesus, they were afraid because they knew who he was. They knew of his authority. He had authority over him. Well, who is this man who has authority over the demons? He had the authority to order them to do whatever he wanted them to do. He could order them into hell. And that's exactly what's going to happen on the day of judgment, although technically it's going to be ordering them into the lake of fire where they're going to be tormented forever. But he could order them into hell at that very moment, and they must obey him. Luke 8, 28, seeing Jesus, he that is a demon-possessed man, cried out and fell before him and said in a loud voice, what business do we have with each other? Jesus, son of the most high God, I beg you, do not torment me. Notice he knows who Jesus is, and, and how does he know that? Well, you know, if we, if we uh, think about Milton's Paradise Lost, it's because the demons used to be angels and they saw the Son of God in heaven and they knew who he was. But they said further in verse 31, they were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. Jesus, do not order us into the pit or into hell. Do not torment us before the time. There is a sense in which the demons are in chains and they are under darkness and they are being tormented, but there's also this liberty they have to travel various places and create mischief. But Jesus has authority over that. You know, it's been said, God has the devil on a chain. And we do know that he does. Remember, Satan had to ask God permission before he could do anything to Job. There's nothing that Satan or the devils can do that God does not grant permission and so he realized he was under the authority of the Son of Man, the Son of God. So Jesus next asked him, what is your name? Now, he didn't do this because Jesus didn't know. 
But he did this because he wanted those who were with him to know who this one was and basically how many there were within them and the significance of what it was he was about to do. And the demon answers, legion, for many demons had entered him. And I already pointed out a legion, at least in Roman terms, was about 6,000. We don't know if that was the exact number. But many demons had taken up residence within the man. You know, spirits don't take up space, right? Uh, the, the sort of the, the bait that was going on in, I think it was the Middle Ages or maybe it was uh, later Middle Ages about how many angels could dance on the head of a pin. It sounds like a strange kind of a argument to debate, but it wasn't because they wanted to know the exact number that would fit. They, just, they were arguing whether or not angels actually take up any space in, in the physical realm. And the answer was no, they don't. They don't take up space. How could you have a legion of demons inside of one man? Well, it's because they don't take up any space. Many of them can live in one place at one time, and that's what they were doing in this man. Now, the demons also knew that they had to leave this man. Because Jesus was commanding them, we read in Luke, that they depart. And so they asked permission that perhaps he wouldn't send them out of the country, but might allow them instead to enter the swine, the pigs, the herd of pigs that were, that were basically there. Jesus gave them permission. And they left the man and they entered into the swine. And the whole herd immediately rushed down into the lake and they were drowned. Now again, uh, here's another great example of the destructive nature of demons, right? Their main target is mankind. They, they are active and they are creating mischief and they're behind a lot of what we see going on in the world. They, there's a lot of evil within us as well, within the people of this world. They don't need to be doing that, as it were. There'd be plenty of evil without them, but they are actively in the world. As I've said, that's their main target because man is the image of God, but if they cannot destroy man, then they will destroy God's creatures, and that's what they did here. Now, one ethical question might be raised at this point. You know, what about the fact that Jesus gave them permission to go into the swine and to destroy this entire herd? Uh, we read in Mark, in Mark 5.13, that there were 2,000 swine, 2,000 animals that, that were destroyed here in just a moment. This would be quite a loss for the farmers, wouldn't it, to lose your whole herd of swine? Well, of course, the problem with this was, was this. What these farmers were doing, these were Jewish farmers, and what they were doing was contrary to God's law. It, it may be okay for us to eat the unclean animals today, but it wasn't okay for them. So they shouldn't have been raising the swine. They, they, these animals shouldn't have actually even been there. So this was an act of discipline against them, as well as, of course, a way in which the Lord was displaying his glory. This tells us that when we disobey the Lord, he graciously corrects us. That was an act of grace that he destroyed that herd because they weren't supposed to be eating those things or trading with them. But again, he also used it as evidence that everyone could see that Jesus really could cast out demons. I mean, how do we know this isn't just a crazy man, right? Well, the fact that when the demons are cast out, this entire herd suddenly rushes off the, the, uh, the, basically the edge of the cliff and, and they perish in the water. It proves that Jesus has power over the invisible realm by making it very visible. Now, thirdly, we see how the people in the surrounding area responded. Uh, they didn't thank Jesus, right, for what he did. I mean, what did Jesus do for them? Well, first of all, he got rid of this very dangerous man that was living among the tombs. You know, he cleared out this, demoni this demoniac. You, th you think they'd be grateful that they no longer needed to be afraid and, and avoid the area where this man lived in case they happened to go by that way? You can imagine what that would be like. It's one thing to go down a road where you know there might be robbers behind each corner, but what if there's a demon-possessed man who has this kind of strength who hates you and wants to destroy you? They should have thanked him for that, and they should have also thanked him for ridding them of the temptation to eat all this pork so that they could more easily obey the Lord. But instead, we find that they were afraid of him. They wanted Jesus to leave. Get out of here, Jesus. Go somewhere else. Why? Well, it's because Jesus had just shown them who he really is. He was shining the light of his, well, of his presence, of his authority, right? 
He is the Son of God. And this frightened them because they hated that light. They hated God. They hated Jesus. I mean, isn't that what the Jews displayed when they called out for his crucifixion at the very end? Remember what Jesus said in John 3, verse 20, for everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Well, Jesus' light was shining. It was making them afraid that their sins were going to be exposed. And so they said, Jesus, would you take the light somewhere else? We don't want to be exposed. Now, this should remind us of at least one thing. We shouldn't think that those who don't know Jesus will come to him if they can just see who he actually is. If you can reveal Jesus to someone, they're actually going to do the opposite of what you want them to do. They're going to they're gonna want you to leave. Isn't that what we find oftentimes when we share Jesus with other people? They want us to leave. They want to shut us down because they don't want that light shining in their eyes. That's what's going to happen unless the Lord opens their eyes to show them the beauty of that light um, and their need for him as he did with the demoniac because he had quite a different response to Jesus, didn't he? Whereas the city rejected him, the demoniac worshipped him. That's quite a difference, isn't it? When the Lord saves, when the Lord gives his Holy Spirit, he also gives us love. And that love, as remember Dr. Sproul reminded us on Wednesday night as we're looking at the indwelling power of love, that love will change us in at least three areas. First of all, we'll want to worship God. Secondly, we'll want to listen to what he says in his word. We won't come to his word anymore telling it what we want it to say, you know, trying to find evidence against what, what it clearly says so we can do what we want to do, but rather we'll listen to what it says and then we'll do it, okay? That's what love does. That's what the presence of the Holy Spirit does in our hearts, and that's what it did to this man. This man before was afraid of Jesus, of course, when he was under the control of these demons. Now he loved the Lord, and he wanted to follow him, just like the rest of his disciples. Jesus, can I follow you? Uh, Luke 8, 38, but the man from whom the demons had gone out was begging him that he might accompany him. And when's the last time we begged Jesus that we could follow him? Okay. This man loved the Lord. He wanted to worship him in this way. But, notice, Jesus would have him serve in another way. Verses 38 and 39, but he sent him away saying, return to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. In other words, go and share your testimony with the people who know you because they're the ones who will be most likely to listen to you. And of course, our Lord would have us do the same. When he changes our lives, he wants us to interact with the people who knew us before so they can see those changes as a testimony to them. That's what it means, share your testimony, be a witness. And we see the man didn't buck at what Jesus had to say. He submitted, listened to him, and he did it. Verse 39, so he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Yeah, being that witness Jesus called him to be, being that light. Now, the last thing I want us to look at is maybe some interesting applications, how, how we can apply this, and, and maybe some of these are obvious, but maybe they're not. So what should we learn from this? Well, first of all, we, we should first of all learn to be thankful that Jesus has set us free from something that is very much like these demons, you know, not to the same degree, but certainly of the same character. Now, we should, first of all, I think, be thankful that we are not in the same situation as this demoniac, right? But by the grace of God, there go I. I mean, why aren't we demon-possessed? Well, it's only because of the Lord's mercy. There is some debate today as to whether or not demon possession still takes place. I'm not going to get into that right now, but uh, let's, let's not discredit that, okay? Through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, though, whether they can or not, demons can't hurt us. Okay, we are delivered from their power. They cannot possess us. So we need to be thankful for that. But we also need to be thankful that the Lord has delivered us, if we are trusting Jesus this morning, from something that is very much like these demons, and that is our sin. Okay? Demons, 
If we were to characterize demons, how would we characterize them? They hate God. I'd say that's probably, you know, they're, they're powerful. They have all these, you know, natural abilities and, and so forth, the attributes. But morally, they hate God. I think we can define them in that way. The devil hates God. The demons hate God. They would destroy God if they could. What's true of fallen man? What's true, what does the sin in their hearts make them want to do? Well, as Jonathan Edwards once said, if fallen man could take Jesus and tear him off his throne and put him to death, they would do exactly that. And how do we know that's true? Because they already did, right? The Son of God appeared, and instead of loving him, they hated him, and they crucified him. Sin is the hatred of God. Sin basically shares the same nature, the same moral nature as these demons. Now, the world, I would, I would suggest, is a grand testimony to the truth of this because the world shares many of the same characteristics uh, basically uh, as these demons. In other words, uh, people are basically doing what these demons were compelling the man to do, right? I mean, the demons took control of this man. Does sin control the people in this world at all? Uh, they compelled him to strip off his clothing. Is the world, as you look around, is it tending to do kind of the same thing? I mean, we haven't gotten to the point yet, although there are places, I understand, where people do these things. We haven't gotten to the place yet where everybody's walking around naked, but it seems like we are going further and further that direction. They drove the man away from church. Uh, do we see people of this world? Do we see people leaving the church? Isn't that what Ken Ham has been telling us? More and more people are leaving the church. The demons kept death constantly before the eyes of this man. Are people obsessed with death in this culture? Is, is basically a sin doing the same thing? And I think particularly trying to avoid it, right? Because nobody wants to die. Uh, the demons made it so that no one could restrain this man from basically uh, expressing what these demons want. Can we say that, is, there, is it really possible to restrain the world from expressing what they desire to do with, with their sins? I mean, that's, the Lord calls us to be a restraining influence, but just how easy is that? They tormented this man. People today are tormented by many different things, and it all stems, I think, from the guilt of their sins. They do things that are wrong. They carry around a bunch of baggage, and eventually they want to do the same thing the demon was moving this man to do to himself, and that is to injure himself. There are people today who cut themselves, you know, and injure themselves in various ways, and they do even worse. They take their own lives. Over the last 19 years, the suicide rate has increased 33% in, I think that's Western culture. They move the man to attack other people. Do we see the world attacking other people? Do we see sin moving people to attack people? I mean, isn't that what the history of the world proves? It's a history of warfare and bloodshed. When we read the newspaper, do we see people doing nice things to one another? I, well, I'm sure it happens in some places, but um, I think we see a lot of attacks, don't we? People attacking other people. Now, we need to be thankful that Jesus set us free from this. We came into the world in slavery to sin. That is exactly what we were like. But he broke the power of that sin within us by his Holy Spirit. We saw that in our meditation in Romans 6, verses 17 and 18. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed, and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Now, these are two different types of slavery, as I've already pointed out before. You know, we, we, wanted, to do, we wanted to do both, but the, the slavery to sin was basically causing us to do destructive things to ourselves and to other people, and in the end, it would have destroyed us. But now the Lord has changed our hearts by His Holy Spirit and made us want to do what is right, so that slavery is from the heart to do what is good, and the outcome of that, as we're reminded, is eternal life. Now, but here's a warning. We do still have sin in our hearts, don't we? Those same tendencies are still there. I mean, can any of us say that we're absolutely free from those tendencies we've just talked about? We need to make sure that we are fighting against them. The Lord has freed us from sin. It can no longer command us, but we can still yield to it. And we need, as we're reminded in Scripture, to put that 
desire to death and to yield to what the Spirit of God is leading us to do, to yield to righteousness. Paul writes this in Romans 8, 13. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. I want you to notice if by the Spirit, because that's the only way you can do this, you are putting to death, that is killing, these deeds or these sinful actions of the body, you will live. Because if you're doing that, it shows you have the Spirit of God in you. Right? If you're not doing this, you don't have the Spirit of God. You're still bound by sin and a slave to sin, and you need to be free from sin. But again, the point is, even though Jesus has freed us, we still have these tendencies we need to fight against them. And so what do we do in order to fight against it? Well, of course, we resist sin, but we give ourselves to the Lord, and yield ourselves as slaves of righteousness, our response to him for delivering us from our sins should be the same as the demoniac and not that of the people of the city, right? The people were afraid of Jesus. They hated Jesus. They said, get out of here, Jesus. We don't want you around here. But the man who was delivered worshiped him. By the way, I think the more we worship the Lord, the stronger we're going to be spiritually. Jesus wants us to yield to the Spirit. He wants us to love he wants us to love him in the way that he calls us to love him. He wants us to worship him. What does that mean? Well, it means to gather together with the people of God and worship him on his day. It means to worship him not only on the Lord's day, but in our, in our households, as families, or privately, uh, as individuals in our prayer closets. It means to basically live for his glory all during the week. We are to worship him in the way that we live. I mean, it's to be a continual act of worship, as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12. We need to listen to what he says in his word. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Well, if you come to the word of God and you impose your ideas on the word, that's not really being conformed to the word. That's trying to make the word conform to your ideas. We need to understand what the word actually says, what God is saying, and, and accept it. And then we need to do it. We need to serve him. We need to offer ourselves up completely to the Lord. Not be part-time Christians, but full-time Christians. Worshiping him with our whole lives, with, with every power of our being, with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength. This is what his spirit has given us the power to do. And this is the reason why he freed us is that we might uh, live in this liberty, this freedom of the children of God, free from sin and free now to obey Him and glorify Him. Well, may the Lord help us to do that. He's given us, really, He's given us that help, but we do need to cooperate with it. Let's not forget our part of it. We need to be working against sin, yielding to the Spirit, worshiping the Lord, and as we do, we will grow more and more into the image of the Lord. Well, let's bow, shall we, for a moment of prayer, and, and let's ask the Lord to help us, um, help us do that.